Hello, Akharja. Welcome to Stories, Legends and Wonders of Oren. Oren is also known as Inishmoor, the largest of the three Aran Islands. I'm Dara Malloy, Dara Omailia, Askelge. This is episode number five, Champel Benin, or Champel Venoin, the smallest church in Ireland. So this church here, Chapel Benin, it's called. Benin was the name of the person who took over from St. Patrick. This church here is unique in a number of ways. First of all, all the Celtic churches, when they started to be built in stone, face east-west, which means the east gable is, has a window in it facing the rising sun in the morning, representing the risen Christ. And inside that window is the altar. So the altar is lit up by the rising sun. It's very metaphorical. So every church is built that way, but this one isn't. This one is facing northeast rather than east. Um, and the second thing about it is that the east gable doesn't have a window. It has a door, most unusual. And it doesn't have an altar inside at all. So there are a number of things about this church which are different. And many people over the years writing about the Iron Islands have suggested why. And none of them, to my mind, are very convincing. And I come up here myself, I'm telling you a secret now. I came up here myself on December 21st one year when the sky was blue and I could see for miles and I thought I have an idea. The church is aligned to the setting sun on the winter solstice. So I came up here and I found out I was totally wrong. And then by chance I looked down the edge of the stone wall like this and because it was a clear day I could see very far. Down here to my left is the western coast of Ireland, down Clare into Limerick and down into Kerry. Um, but most of the time you don't see it. But on a clear evening on December 21st, I could see it quite clearly. And when I look down here, this wall is lined up perfectly to the top of this, the holy mountain, Mount Brandon, on the very edge of the Dingle Peninsula. Now that was a very, that's always been a holy mountain and it's named after St. Brendan the Navigator. So it makes total sense that this church here and this monastery here would want to be connected with the monks in the Dingle Peninsula, where there were many monasteries as well, and particularly connected with St. Brendan. So there's the explanation. Now I've let the secret out of the bag. So I want you to consider now, and use your imagination to do this, what the monastic village might have looked like in the 7th and 8th century. The round tower maybe was built, just built, the Celtic crosses were all carved and the pilgrims were coming in their thousands and there were lots and lots of monks living here as well. Um, just to remind you, mon monastery, Celtic monasteries wanted to be the same size of a community as Jesus and his apostles, so not a big community, 12 monks, maybe one abbot or one abbess. So if more than that came along and there was nowhere else to put them, you put them beside the first group of monks. So you had two monastic communities living side by side. And each of them would have had their own monastic cells, their abbot's cell, their little chapel to house the 13 of them, a place to eat, a place to, to, um, to wash and clean up and all that type of thing, and a place to house guests, which was a central part of of every monastic community. So when a second community set up beside the first, they too had all these, this infrastructure, if you like, as part of their community. So you had a church, for example. So some monasteries in Ireland ended up with the title Seven Churches. Glendalough did, Clamac Noyes did. Here probably did as well. And we have another monastery over the far side of the island that's still called the Seven Churches to this day. So when you hear the title Seven Churches, you are invited to think of a large community of monks and even a large collection of monasteries, monastic communities, because each of them would have had their own church. And if they had seven churches, that meant they had seven communities, which would be a sort of a perfect number. It's not necessarily an accurate mathematical number, but there's evidence even back only as far as 150 years that this area here 
still had the remains of six churches here, even 150 years ago. So it's very easy to imagine they had seven or more churches here way back in the 7th and 8th century. What a wonderful view the monk who lived up here would have had. However, his role in living up here was not to be enjoying himself at all. It was to live the penitential life. He was practicing what they called at the time green martyrdom. So you have red martyrdom, which is when you get your throat slit or you're burnt at the stake. Very few Irish monks were able to suffer red martyrdom. So they invented, through their imagination, green martyrdom as well as white martyrdom. So green martyrdom is to live in such a way that is really tough. Now, if you choose to live up here at the top of this hill, it might look nice today, but you're exposed to all the winds and rain coming in off the Atlantic. There's no shelter whatsoever up here. And also, because you've chosen to live up here as an anchorite, and that's your official title, you're an anchorite, all the monks down below are Cenobites. So they work together, pray together, eat together. You work on your own, pray on your own, eat on your own. That's the difference. You're the anchorite that's part of the community life of the monastery below. And you've got a particular role to live a penitential life. For example, just like out in a fishing boat, when the monks are asleep, you stay awake. You have to vigil while they're all asleep. You're watching out. You're praying while nobody else is praying. Um, also, you're eating very simple food, which they're sending up to you. And they'll all send, also send you up people uh, who might seek your counsel or your prayer or your healing or whatever else. So the, uh, the presence of this um, anchorite's um, little chapel, this is an oratory, and he prayed in here when he wasn't praying outside, and he slept in there. So you can see his monastic cell there is just about big enough for him to sleep in. And then the church is not much bigger. The church is the same size, I would estimate, as a double bed. Now, he didn't have anybody sleeping with him. I don't think so. Um, but that's the size of it. It wasn't for sleeping in anyway. It was for praying in. But it's the smallest church in Ireland. And some people say it's the smallest church in Europe. But between this monastic presence up here of the Anchorite, plus the, the round tower and the um, Celtic cross down below, you've got an, a good indication of the sophistication of this monastic community. They had reached their zenith. They had reached the golden age. You know that Ireland had a golden age in the 7th and 8th century, before they started collapsing with the attacks of the Vikings, and before, of course, the Norman invasion, which came in the 12th century. But before that, the 7th and 8th century, the monastic movement had boomed all over the country. Wherever you find a place in Ireland named C-I-L-L -L something or K-I-L-L -L something, that's the monastic cell of some monk that's been that that village or town has been named after. And of course we have them everywhere. We have Killarney, we have Kildare, we have Kilkenny and so on. They're just everywhere. We have three or four even villages here on the island uh, named after with the, with, the, with the prefix Kil. So Kilainia, Kilainy is where we are at present. Kilronan is the village just down the road. The monastic movement in Ireland was a new way of living and a new model of community. Until that time, people lived either as a member of their own tribe or as a member of the tribe they had married into. But here was a total other way to live, where you came together with other people who all shared your vision and you lived out that vision. And it was based on the vision of the founder. It wasn't based on a document that was written out. Most religious orders today, all of them in fact in the Christian tradition I believe, have a written constitution which links them to Rome and to the Pope and to his authority. These monasteries didn't have a written constitution. The vision for the monastic community in which they were living was the vision of their founder. And that's why the grave of the founder was so important that they constantly went on pilgrimage to it to revitalize that vision that they had for that community. So every monastic community in Ireland was slightly different. Some were very relaxed, some were quite severe. 
and um, they brought that model of monastic community out into Europe then, all over Europe. And, um, and it clashed a little bit with what Rome was trying to do, which was promote a model of religious life that Rome could control. Well, they couldn't control the Celtic monasteries, sadly, um, maybe not sadly, but it led to them, led to their demise. And in the end, Celtic monasteries all across Europe had to take on the rule of St. Benedict, which was a rule that had been adapted and developed and was now under the control of the Pope. So when you took on that rule, you took on the control of the Pope instead of the inspiration of your own founder. My wife, uh, Tess Harper Malloy, um, has published a new book of her poetry and photographs uh, of Inish Moore. So it goes well with these, this series of videos and talks I'm giving. The name of her book is Inish Moore, Poems and Images of Orin. So naturally enough, she's lived here for almost 40 years now, and she's collected up both the poems and the photographs over that period. So some of the people mentioned in the poems are sadly no longer with us. In, in fact, some of the buildings she's photographed are no longer with us. But none the play, none, nonetheless, as she says herself, uh, Inishmore is a place that you never forget once you have visited it. And it's a, a place that, you, that sustains you uh, if you choose to live here. So I hope you enjoy uh, the poetry and images in the book if you choose to buy it or to borrow it. Um, it's available from www.ashlingpublications.com and we're making it available on other platforms as well over time.